Good evening, everybody. Just a quick public service announcement. I'm missing a five-year-old. Has anybody seen my five-year-old? Just kidding, just kidding. I found him. I found him. If you have some younger kids, there is somebody downstairs that will uh, take care of them for you tonight. If you got, what is it, fifth and sixth graders, you can keep them up here with us because they're old enough to um, understand what's going on. We'd love to have them in here with us adults. And uh, other than that, I'll leave you to uh, your own decisions. Would you stand with me? We'll open up with a word of prayer. We'll get this evening started. Father God, Lord, thank you so much for this evening, for your care over us today, for getting us safely here tonight. Father, we're so thankful we get to get into your word, to be encouraged, to be challenged. Father, it's so awesome that we can stand firm on the words that you've passed down through the ages, that they've held true. Never once have they been proven false or untrustworthy. We're so thankful that we can rely on you in everything. I pray and ask that this week we would, that we would use the strength that you give us to be lights, to shine in this world full of darkness, and to be bold, Father, and that everything that we do will be done with love, that we would truly be concerned with the souls of those around us, our own family, our own friends, our own community. Father, I know that that's your will for us, that we would be disciples of your word and that we would make disciples. Thank you for this opportunity tonight. May we use the word that you've given us to propel ourselves and to be effective witnesses. Thank you so much for Jim coming up here to speak with us. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right. What's today? Day, today's date? Are we at the 27th? Okay, all right, we're good. I got the right songs. We're in good shape. Let's sing Thrive together. Some of you may know it, some of you may not. Just fake it till you make it, all right? <laughs> worn and weary land where many a dream has died like a tree planted by the water we never will run dry so living water flowing through god we thirst for more of you fill our hearts and flood our souls with one desire just to know you and to make you known, we lift your name on high. Shine like the sun, make darkness run and hide. We know we were made for so much more than ordinary lives. It's time for us to more than just survive. We were made to thrive. Into your word we're digging deep to know our Father's heart. Into the world we're reaching out to show them who you are. So living water flowing through, God we thirst for more of you. Fill our hearts and flood our souls with one desire. Just to know you and to make you know we lift your name on high. Shine like the sun, make darkness. 
is running high. We know we were made for so much more than ordinary lives. It's time for us to more than just survive. We were made to thrive. Unspeakable, faith unsinkable, love unstoppable, anything is possible. Joy unspeakable, faith unsinkable, love unstoppable, anything is possible. Joy unspeakable, faith unsinkable, love unstoppable, anything is possible. Joy unspeakable, faith unsinkable, love unstoppable. Anything is possible Just to know you and to make you known We lift your name on high Shine like the sun, make darkness run and hide We know we were made for so much more than ordinary lives it's time for us to more than just survive. We were made to thrive. We were made to thrive. can have a seat this other one's a pretty new one for us we've been doing it for a short time it's called good good father let's sing that one together oh i've heard a thousand stories of what they The tender whisper of love in the dead of night And you tell me that you're pleased and that I'm never alone You're a good, good father It's who you are, it's who you are, it's who you are And I'm loved by you it's who I am, it's who I am, it's who I am. Oh, I've seen many searching for answers far and wide, but I know we're all searching for answers. Only you provide, cause you know. What we need before we say a word You're a good, good Father It's who you are It's who you are It's who you are And I'm loved by you It's who I am It's who I am It's who I am Cause you're perfect in all of your ways You are 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 perfect in all of your ways, of your ways. Of your ways. too are Still as you 
It's who you are, it's who you are, and I'm loved by you. It's who I am, it's who I am, it's who I am. You're a good, good father. It's who you are, it's who you are, it's who you are, and I'm loved by you. It's who I am, it's who I am. It's who I am. Amen. Jim, you ready? Come on up. We only get three great songs, only two tonight? Yeah. Okay, I'm running guys. out of... <laughs> <laughs> well, you'll have to make it up tomorrow with yeah. four, right? Yep. Okay, guys. Good evening, everybody. Good evening. Great to see you out on this great... It is just the most gorgeous day today, right? You guys have got it made. Sun's out, balmy 72. Wow. Maybe where I live. No, I was talking to my wife. She's like, Jim, it's 87 degrees here. I was like, hmm, wow. Okay, and she goes, and it's so hot because the sun's out. I said, man, I want to take a picture and just let you see the beautiful weather that you guys up here in beautiful Rogers, Ohio are experiencing. I told you I like it, though. I love it. Because I've been able to bring out sweaters and coats that I have had stored in a closet for centuries. I'm glad they haven't moth-eaten, all right? So anyway, thank you for coming out tonight. I've had a great time hanging out with your preachers. Uh, what a great bunch of guys these are. I love the vision of this church. I love where you are. I love where you're getting ready to go, all right? You are on mission with God. Isn't it great to be a part of a church that's actually on mission with God? Huh? Right? Okay, so that's why Paul wrote 1 Thessalonians, because he wanted to make sure that the church at Thessalonica was on mission with God. That's why this letter is so important for the church of Christ's day. So let's go ahead and take a look at the fourth chapter, 1 Thessalonians 4. Uh, now tonight, we're not going to be in a hurry, but we will you know, finish on time, Lord willing. But I am going to be, uh, and, and Jason's helping me set all this up, but we actually have a second rev <laughs> revival tonight. Um, that um, it's an hour and a half after this, so we're not going to take it, you know, past the time. But the uh, the uh, the Constant Springs Church of Christ outside of Kingston, Jamaica, is having a revival, and they said, "Would you be able to zoom over here in Jamaica?" So Jason has redecorated his office for me. He's got a little miniature pulpit, right? Got it in there. Jason's agreed to stand on top of the sanctuary with a coat hanger to make sure we get. Excellent, excellent uh, connection, internet connection with all those fine souls in Kingston, Jamaica, the Church of Christ there. So that's going to be exciting. But tonight, I'd like us to look at the fourth chapter of 1 Thessalonians. Again, how shall we live? How shall we live? Oh, look, I don't want to take a guess at what it takes to get to heaven. I don't want to meander through life hoping that I'm pleasing God, hoping that I get to heaven. I want to know that I'm going to heaven, and I want to know... What I'm doing is either pleasing God or displeasing God. That's why 1 Thessalonians was written. How shall we live? This is how we shall live. This is how we shall live. 1 Thessalonians 4.1, Paul writes, through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, he's in Corinth, right? Since Timothy ahead, he's going to catch up later. Since Timothy ahead, finally then, brethren, we urge and exhort in the Lord Jesus that you should abound more and more, that you should keep on doing what you're doing. Abound more and more, just as you have received from us how you ought to walk and how you ought to please God. So Paul starts out this portion of the letter by saying, finally, brothers, this is how you live. This is how you continue to please God and serve God. This is what your walk should look like. Notice our lifestyle, our lifestyle determines if God is pleased with me. Now, God loves me already. God's love for me is unconditional. For God so loved the world, period. Now, the, really, the question isn't, does God love me? The question is, do I love Him? Yeah, that's really why we're here. We're not here to discuss, well, does God love me? He's already predetermined that. God loves me, sent Jesus for the world, predestined the church. So God's already mapped out a beautiful plan for all of us. He loves us unconditionally. Now, the question is, do I love Him? The Bible says, Jim, if you really love him, you will what? 
you will keep his commandments. You will walk in his way. So the question really isn't tonight questioning whether God's love is comprehensive or not. It is. The question I need to ask myself is, Jim, do you, do you love God? And our lifestyle really determines if God is pleased with me. Now, there is a difference, and I know our, our society doesn't think so, but there is. There is a difference between loving someone unconditionally and affirming their behavior. I've had so many parents come up to me and they've in tears. And like, Jim, my children have, have, have strayed or they frustrated me and, and they're, they're living in sin and, and, and I, I don't know what to say because I don't want them to think I don't love them. And I said, well, first of all, you need to understand because God has already mapped this out so beautifully in the Bible. There is a massive difference between loving someone and affirming their behavior. All right, I've already told my kids, my love for you is not based on your behavior. I've already determined I'm going to love you to the day you die. But you need to understand this as well, that I will not affirm obstreperous behavior. If your behavior is offensive to God, I owe it to you. I owe it to you. I owe it to our family to challenge and encourage you to get back on track. So our society, though, has gotten love and affirmation all confused. There is a, a book written, um, uh, and it's, uh, it's, it's, it's entitled the, the New Tolerance by Chuck McDowell. It's not really, it's not really a, a new book. Uh, it's been out for a while, but The New Tolerance, and you ought to get this book. He does a great job. But he's def he defines the tolerance movement in contemporary society in relationship to Christ's ability to be tolerant with sinners in the Gospels. McDowell says, tolerance says you must agree with me. I mean, and this is the mantra coming from contemporary society. You have to embrace my lifestyle. You have to embrace it. So tolerance says you must agree with me. But biblical love responds, no, I got to do something harder, friend. I have to tell you the truth because I'm convinced that truth will set you free. Big difference. Tolerance says you must approve of what I do. And you hear that coming from the contemporary culture of today's society. All right, postmodern America is all about receiving, accepting, endorsing, and advocating for every behavior imaginable. Tolerance, the new tolerance in America that says, you've got to approve of what I do. But a Christian practicing biblical love responds, no, I've got to do something harder. I will love you even when your behavior offends me. Tolerance says, you must allow me to have my way. Biblical love responds, no, I've got to do something harder, friend. I will plead with you to follow the right way because I believe you are worth the risk. And when Christians show the world that we can get in the trenches, get in the mud with people, celebrate recovery, forces leadership in the church to get in the trenches with people that are hurting and show them not what modern tolerance looks like, because I'm going to tell you something. Modern society says stay out of their business, let them continue their lifestyle. The Christian says, I can't, because I don't want them to go to hell. See? See, the new tolerance movement says, let everybody do whatever they want in this world, the secular world, the, the personal world, the, the physical world. But the Christian says, no, no, I want to point that sinful, dying individual to a better world, the kingdom world, where they can be baptized into Christ for the forgiveness of the sin. They can be empowered with the Holy Spirit. They can get on a spiritual diet and begin to cut away the sin that has so easily entangled them and then point them where? To the eternal world, heaven for eternity. I mean, that's, that's why spiritual love works and triumphs over this modern tolerance movement. Tolerance in today seeks to be inoffensive. But love, no, love takes risks. See, we have conversations that are uncomfortable because we know that love is willing to take risks. Tolerance is indifference. Love is active. Tolerance costs nothing. Love costs everything. Jesus is the supreme example of true Christian love. Is he not? I mean, it doesn't, you don't have to look far to find what genuine, authentic love looks like because Christ modeled it, which is sometimes the antithesis of contemporary tolerance. His love drove him to cruel death on the cross, far from being indifferent to the lifestyle choices of others. He paid the price of those choices with his own life and lovingly paved the way for everyone to go and sin no more, John 8, 11. Wow. I'm so glad I don't have to continue living in my sin. I'm so glad that Jesus' blood covers those sins and gives me a hope of eternal life in that third world. 
So, Paul says, okay, I want you to walk in a way that pleases God. The only way that I can please God is to walk in the shadow of this Holy Spirit. Verse 2, for you know what commandments we gave you through the Lord Jesus Christ. So Paul spent sufficient time in this letter reminding the brethren at Thessalonica and us tonight at Lake Mount that he has been trying to get them to understand, I'm, I'm, I want to get there and visit with you. And he's already told us in the second and third chapter that Satan's putting up roadblocks, hindrances, barriers. And you might be thinking tonight, man, Jim, there are times where I feel like I know what God wants me to do and I'm, I'm making that effort, but Satan is putting every obstacle in my way. Well, that means you're about ready to do something big for God. And we serve a God who's able to remove the barriers. So Satan creates the barriers, but we serve a God who can remove them. So keep on plowing ahead. This is why Timothy was sent, because he was unable to travel there himself. But he eventually got there. He eventually got there. He has been very encouraging up to this point, reminding the community, believers, keep the faith. And I just want to encourage you as we've wound up the revival tomorrow night. Tonight, listen, this is not the time for the church to run and hide. This is not the time for the church of Christ to apologize for its stand on biblical marriage, for its stand for life, for its stands on liberty and First Amendment rights to exercise our faith as the, the, the developers of our Constitution so eloquently placed in our nation's lap over 220 odd years ago. This is not the time for the church to apologize for the fact that we meet the blood of Christ in Christian baptism, that we participate in the Lord's Supper every first day of the week as the early church did. This is not our time to apologize that marriages need to be restored, that sexual immorality is still wrong. Middle C is Middle C 100 years ago, today and 1,000 years from now, is it not? Truth is not changeable if you look at it through the lens of Christianity. Objective truth transcends time. So Paul says to Lake Mount Church of Christ, Jim, remind them, keep the faith, keep the faith. Be ready for persecution. It's there. 1 Thessalonians 3.8. We read it uh, two nights ago. Stand fast in the Lord. Stand fast in the Lord. 1 Thessalonians 2.19. We read it Sunday night. Rejoice and prepare for the Lord's appearance. All right. It's going to happen. But we have to withstand trial. Francis Chan, in his book, Letters to the Church, says many Christians are arrested in Iran and either executed or imprisoned for years. We read about this all the time. Fellowship, he says, looks a lot different when the church consists of those who have a biblical understanding of Christianity. Interestingly, some research shows that Iran has the fastest growing quote-unquote evangelical population in the whole world. He said, when a friend of mine came back from visiting a church in Iraq, I asked him what the biggest difference was between churches in America and the church in Iraq. And he said these words, what we call sanctification they call a prerequisite. In other words, we act as though surrender is a lifelong process where we slowly, eventually evolve and decide whether or not we will give up certain things to God. Meanwhile, the believers in Iraq teach the way to Jesus is the way that Jesus taught. They are required to count the costs, surrender everything up front. Otherwise, they cannot join the body of Christ. Years ago, Chan says, I was in China and visited an underground church gathering where I asked them about the persecution. Get this. Each person who stood up started sharing stories about persecution he or she had endured. Sometimes they had to hide in the walls because the government officials were coming their direction. Some of them even had to run from gunshots. But I wish you could hear the way they were sharing their stories. Everyone was just laughing like it was a party. It sounded completely insane to me hearing them laugh about being shot at. But it didn't faze them because they just expected persecution. That's what Paul's challenging the church of Christ to realize that we will face imminent persecution if we hold fast the truths of Scripture. And in these Chinese prayers, they actually were screaming out to God to take them to the most dangerous places in China. They were crying out to God, I want to suffer for you, and I don't want to go to a safe place. Please, I want to be counted worthy to die in your name. And that's the way they prayed. And if you have a group like that, how are you going to stop a church that's asking God, send me wherever you want. The more intolerant the people are, the more hateful the people are, that's the people I want to go and see. That's why the church is supposed to be an unstoppable force. 
ready to take a hit and get right back in the battle. No retreats. No retreats. Onward, Christian soldiers, marching as to war. <laughs> we play that song every chapel service for our students. Now, some might think, man, what is this? Like at a military camp? I want these kids to know. That's not only the mission field out there, that's a battlefield. And it's a battlefield for the souls of mankind. And I want to save everybody we can. But we got to determine the fact that the battle is real. But so are the victories, amen? My daughter, uh, she went to India for a mission trip. And um, Raj and Ipe is just a phenomenal missionary in Kerala, India. And she was there for five weeks, a couple years ago. And... Uh, we found out that Rajan was putting her on a train, a 12-hour train. You've seen these trains in India, right? All right. Uh, so it was, she's, and, and we found out she was going to a hostile area because they'd already beaten up some of the preachers that he had trained. So Jeanette emails Rajan. It's like, Rajan, are you sending our daughter to this like, uh, hostile area? And he's like, yeah. Ooh. My wife's like, why? I thought she was going to stay with you. He goes, no, I need to send her there because there's a school and there's a church there and I want her to do some ministry there. And she says, yeah, but it's a hostile area. And you sent pictures a few weeks ago of some of the preachers that had been beaten up. And he said, well, what's your point? She's like, well, I don't want her to get hurt. And this is what he said to her. He sent an email back and said, Jeanette, if something happens, she dies for the Lord, can you think of a better way to go? Now, I would have said, Rajan, let me tell you something. You could have worded it just a little differently than that. But I get your point. I get your point. All right, so I want us to know that we are to keep the faith. We're to continue to run the race. But we are to prepare. Persecution's around the corner. John Weatherly, uh, who's a professor at Johnson University, st uh, states these words. Paul shifts his approach. He wants the readers to, quote, think and behave according to the gospel which they have received. Now, don't just hear it, but put it to practice. So verses, so verses 3 through 8. For this is the will of God, that you sanctify yourself, that you should abstain from sexual immorality. Verse 5, stay away from passions of lust. You know how the Gentiles live? He says, they don't know God. So we expect them to live that way. But you know God. You've, you've bought into His Son's plan of salvation. You're saved. You're sanctified. The word sanctified means what? Set apart. All right. God was always trying to set His people apart. That's why He got them out of Egypt. Say, I've got to get you out of Egypt if I'm going to set you apart. That's why the books of law, the Pentateuch was written. Customs, laws, regulations that they needed to live by in order to be different. Remember when Joshua takes the reins from Moses and he says to the people, you can serve the gods that your father Abraham served in Mesopotamia, or you can go back to serving the gods that your ancestors served in Egypt, or you can, you can go ahead and serve the gods of the Amorites, the people that surround you right now. But I would like to encourage you that this, to follow us because for me and my house, we've made a decision. We're going to serve the Lord. All right. So the options are there. But Paul says, look, you see how the Gentiles are living? You see how confused they are? How deprecated they are? You see how lost they are? I don't want you to live like that. I want you to be sanctified, set apart. That word means. All right. That each of you, verse 4, should know how to possess his vessel or his life, body, in sanctification and honor not in passions of lust no one should take advantage verse 6 of and defraud his brother in this matter because the lord is the avenger of all such as we also forewarned you and testified for god did not call us to uncleanliness but rather to holiness verse 8 therefore he who rejects and does not reject man but god who has also given us his holy spirit so paul says in verse 2 verse 2 it's by the authority of the Lord Jesus Christ that I'm giving you this instruction. So it's solid, all right? I'm not making this stuff up as I go along. Paul very frequently referred to the teachings of Jesus in regard to how a believer should conduct their life because that gave it credibility. So when we preach, and I guess it was, I think it was Jason the other day that said uh, in his closing remarks, the best thing for a Christian to do when asked about a biblical statement or a belief that you have based on scriptural authority, don't ever say, well, my opinion, or this is what I think, or this is what we teach. No, this is what the scriptures say. See, it places all the authority in the lap of God. So if you want to argue, fine, take it up with God, the sovereign one, the great I am. So when someone says, do you guys baptize? I had a lady ask me that just before I flew out. Do you guys baptize? I said, yes. 
And then I said, well, let me share with you why. And I just gave her the scriptures. Okay. And then she asked questions about the spiritual gifts. So instead of saying, well, this is what we teach, or this is what's on our, our Facebook, I simply said, well, this is how the scriptures teach. So the authority is based on biblical truths. So Paul frequently refers to the teachings of Christ in regards to how a believer, a Christian, should conduct their lives. Now, the term Lord in verse 2 is a very appropriate title, for it places the emphasis of Paul's message and warning to the church in direct connection to divine sovereignty. Paul is essentially saying, what I'm about to tell you in this letter is from the hand of God via the Holy Spirit. So we know that holy men of God, 40 men, wrote as they were driven and inspired by the Holy Spirit over a 1,500-year span of time. Verse 3, this is the will of God in regards to your sanctification or being totally set apart from the world's standard of living and behaving. And so verses 1 through 8, Paul expresses this desire for God's people to not take their bodies or their lifestyle or their worldview and belief system and coincide their lifestyle and belief system with the pagan lifestyle and rituals of the Gentile community. You see, that's what gives the church an identity. Are we sinners like the world? Yes. Do we make mistakes like the world? Yes. The difference is, though, we have acknowledged that sin is offensive, repented of those sins, that's a prerequisite for salvation, by the way, and made a 180-degree turn in worldview and lifestyle and now begin to follow the teachings of Christ. And where secular humanism and personal subjective reasoning used to govern our lives, now we channel all of our belief system to the teachings of Christ. When our kids were little, they would sometimes say, hey, can we watch this TV program? Or can we go to this movie? And, you know, sometimes you're like, well, let me, let me read up on it. So what do we do? We, we read up on what Hollywood says and, and says about the movie. Why, like, that's like going to Dracula and thinking, you know, do you have, like, blood bank? You know, like, why would we go to Dracula for a blood bank? You know you're not going to get anything, right? So it's like, why are we asking Hollywood what, if this is an appropriate movie or not? I never quite understood that, right? Okay, so um, I said, well, let, let's, let's look at the content. And then let's ask Philippians 4.8 whether it's a good idea. Whatever things are true, whatever things are noble, whatever things are just, and whatever things are pure, lovely, and a good report, if there's any virtue, if there is anything praiseworthy, then meditate on these things. So what we try to do is teach them, look, if it's noble, if it's true, if it enhances your character development, that's what the word blameless means in 1 Thessalonians, spiritual character development, then it's okay. So that needs to be the litmus test for the things that we choose to do or not. Does it pass the Philippians 4, 8 test? Does it pass the 1 Thessalonians 4, 1 through 8 test? Does it help keep me set apart from the fallen world in which I live? Now the word sanctification in the Old Testament, uh, we, see, we see it defined in three specific ways. It, it, of course, it means to be set apart for God's work. But generally in the Old Testament, people that were set apart were firstborn of Israel, they were set apart. The Sabbath day was set apart, and the priests from the tribe of Levi were set apart. All of these were people or days or offices set apart by God for specific duties under the old law. Now, for a disciple of Christ Jesus, we have also been commanded, have we not, to conform to the image of Jesus in terms of our lifestyle choices. Merrill Tenney writes, In a sense, it is a gift as is every part of salvation, but it must be a daily appropriated through the moral surrender of our life to God. It is a lifelong process completed only when we see Christ return. So if I'm going to take the word sanctification seriously, I have to practice it every day until Jesus Christ returns or until he calls me home. Now, you say, you know, that's, a, that's an exercise, Jim. You better believe it. Now, there are, there are things that God has implemented for us to help us in this journey. I still believe on the first day of the week, we are to examine ourselves. And I think when it says examine ourselves, it, it forces us to think about our actions, our lifestyle, things that we sh did or did not do, either committed sins of commission or omission. But it just gives us a chance to evaluate our walk and to make sure that we're still practicing sanctification. I'm still setting myself apart from the world 
not isolating myself from the world, but setting myself apart from the sin of the world so that I could be the light and example that God wants me to be. Paul specifically calls for holiness and sanctification in the realm of Christian sexuality, in the Christians in regard to sexuality. Now let me say this, because this is, the, this is getting so twisted in our contemporary society. The word sexual immorality in the Scriptures simply means any lifestyle in regards to sexual activity outside of a monogamous relationship between a husband and wife, period. Now, you and I, our minds immediately go to this. That's pretty old-fashioned. That's going to be hard to sell. How are we going to fill churches with that line? One of our own schools, um, just tonight, we were reading in the news, is under fire from the secular community because of their stance on, on homosexuality in regards to hiring faculty who practice that lifestyle. But they're under attack by some of the graduates of these schools. Wow. So let me just say this. The closer we get to the second return of the Lord, the more persecution the church is going to face. Even novel, novice Christians will understand that. But, we will also become more isolated. You know, the word sanctification means set apart. I got news for you. The world is doing its best to set itself apart from the church as fast as it can. So they're practicing sanctification in their own realm. And I don't say that to frighten you. I don't say that to make you feel like, well, we're an island. But the reality is, folks, the church is fast becoming the only entity in the world that's preaching this message. All right, don't expect Tom Cruise to speak from 1 Thessalonians 4 anytime soon. It's not going to happen. I, 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 I seriously, I probably would die of a heart attack if Camille Harris started a campaign speech tomorrow with 1 Thessalonians 4th chapter. She might. Miracles may still happen. If so, please have a defibrillator standing by because I'm going to need one, I promise you. But the reality is, you're not going to hear politicians read from 1 Thessalonians 4. You're not going to see Hollywood read from 1 Thessalonians 4 you're going to see fewer and fewer churches reading from 1 Thessalonians 4. The reality is, though, 1 Thessalonians 4, in regards to the Christian's response to moral living, is an essential part of us still being a light in a dark world. And I tell you what, it frustrates me, it concerns me deeply, that in many churches, sexual immorality is rampant. It's not addressed, people are not encouraged, inspired, and challenged to live holy and separate lives from the fallen world in which we live. Now, we know as we study Western civilization that morality and sexual fidelity was very foreign to Greco-Roman society. In fact, many of the religious cults in the time of Paul's writing actually encouraged engaging in prostitution as an act of worship. A drunkenness along with promiscuity was prominent in the city of Thessalonica. Now, remember when Paul wrote to the church at Ephesus, he specifically honed in on drunkenness. Do not be drunk with wine, which leads to intoxication, but be filled with the Spirit. Primarily because of the city in which he wrote to and the fact that they had an idol worshiping uh, drunkenness and intoxication. Here in Thessalonica, drunkenness and sexual promiscuity was rampant. And Paul said, that's where a spiritual hospital needs to be. But I need, to, I need the people to know that are going there, that are receiving spiritual help, that spiritual help means, look, you've got to cut that sin away so the Holy Spirit can thrive within you. John Weatherly goes on to write, quote, Discipline in sexual matters is not for Paul merely a matter of doing what is best for oneself, but of recognizing God's will and His power to enforce it. Immorality, and I've already defined it based on biblical terms, therefore represents a deliberate ignorance of God and the nature of his call, leaving one subject to God's judgment. Paul's teaching in this section has a remarkable foreign ascent for modern or postmodern civilization. So in verse 6, Paul recognizes that such behavior violates the, quote, sacred boundaries within the marriage unit. Verse 7, God did not call us to uncleanliness, but rather to holiness. Isn't it interesting how he refers to a person caught in the miry clay of sexual immorality in particular as uncleanliness. Now, a person who was unclean in biblical days was a person you could not get close to. And so Paul equates a person caught in sexual sin, 
practicing sexual immorality as an unclean person. Now, here's the good news. Here's the good news. You can change. Grace affords you the opportunity to change. And um, I just want to encourage you tonight, because this is what revivals are good for. They're, they're good for forcing all of us, myself included, to step back and look at my life, my walk, my thought patterns, the words that I say, and, and make sure they're in line and conducive to the light of Christ that's supposed to be within me. So I want us to recognize if we've crossed those boundaries or there is an addiction uh, that has overtaken us, there is opportunity to make the changes so that you can cut away that sin and allow the Holy Spirit to come in and make you the kind of person and the marriage that you need to have grow and prosper. And, uh, and, and according to verse 6, it's possible. But you you got to take that step. you got to recognize the sin and you got to recognize the remedy, Jesus Christ. The power of His Word and His Spirit. Verse 7, God did not call us to uncleanness but to holiness. This is not a suggestion. This is factual. And it's an emphatic point made by Paul to the early church. Now remember, I know what we experience in the present world. We see it all the time. But if we're going to be sanctified as Christians set apart from this world, then we have to realize that our influence in the kingdom is severely damaged if we're still dragging around the sins of yesterday. And I think it severely hinders our hope of of eternal life in heaven. I uh, came back from a revival about four years ago. Jeanette picked me up from the airport and said, Jim, we've got to go to one of our members' homes. I said, what's happening? And she explained that the husband had had an affair, his wife had found out, but that he, had, he was seriously considering walking out of the home. Now, they had a three-year-old child, and they had a six-month-old baby. I said, we need to go right to the house. So I called him up, and I said, we're coming. And he was kind of like, oh, I don't know if that's a good idea. I said, well, I'm not asking you permission. I'll see you in 20 minutes. So we pulled up, and I, I, Jeanette and I walked in, and we sat down on their couch. Of course, she's weeping. She's weeping. And I could hear the kids, you know, the little three-year-old, he's kind of running around in his room, and the baby, she's trying to, you know, keep quiet and take care of, and she's, and he's just got this look on his face of absolute, he's like disengaged from reality. And so I said, so I thought, you know what, I'm not even going to try to talk about the reality of what he's doing, the ramifications on his wife and kids, because evidently that doesn't mean anything to him. So I just simply went right for the throat. I said, okay, Matt, let me ask you a question. Not literally. Not literally. But I said, let me just skip all the mantra and the high, and, and I said, let me just go to, to right to the point. So you're about ready to walk out of this house. You're about ready to walk out, away from these two children that you brought into the world. All right? You brought them into this world. Okay? And you're getting ready to say to them, I no longer want to be your full-time dad and you're ready to look at this beautiful woman who's your wife and you're, 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 you're saying to her, I'd rather fool around than stay faithful to you. And he just looked at the ground. I said, no, I mean, those are your choices. You either get back in this house and be the man and husband you should be or walk out of here. But I said, here's what I want you to think about when you grab your belongings and walk out this door. I want you to think of the fact that any time God could take you, like me and everybody else, and in the twinkling of an eye, you're going to stand before the great I am. Now, I said, you haven't thought that far. You know why? Because all you're thinking about is taking care taking uh, inventory of your sexual needs here because you're you're not mature enough to think so i'm going to help take you down this journey matthew i said so i want to hear you tell me when you stand before the great i am the big throne and god looks at you and says did you not read first thessalonians the fourth chapter matthew did you not read what i said in regards to sexual immorality and faithfulness I said, what are you going to say to God? I said, oh, you haven't thought that through, have you? Well, you better. Because I'm going to tell you right now, according to Scripture, this premeditated act of sexual immorality leaves no room of hope for you based on Scripture. You say, well, that sounds very judgmental. Well, I didn't write the material, but I I thought, young man, you need to know the ramifications of the decision you're about ready to make have eternal consequences attached to them. 
Maybe it's because we've left out the word hell in our sermon so long. People do not understand that hell is for eternity and it's very hot. John MacArthur, in his book, The Gospel According to Jesus, says, quote, shocking forms of open immorality have become commonplace among professing Christians. And why not? The promise of eternal life without surrender to divine authority feeds the unregenerate heart. Enthusiastic converts to this new gospel believe that their behavior has no relationship to their spiritual status. And I'm telling you, our behavior has so much to do with our spiritual status. I read an article the other day that just gave me such hope about spiritual status, the hope that we have in Christ. Lindsay Knight remembers the hopelessness that stalked her as a college student when she had been seen too much and been loved too little. It was in the back of her mind as she chased self-worth and being pretty, thin, and good athlete, and popular, and successful, and after a long string of abusive, destructive relationships, she left her homeless, alone, and broke she took the one yes she found to work at a local strip club. It didn't take long for her to see life at the club wasn't so glamorous. She didn't make a lot of money. She didn't like the kind of attention she received there. And though she was savvy enough to stay away from the drugs and alcohol, she began fighting nausea getting ready for work every night. At the end of her rope, Lindsay knew she needed a better story, so she reached out to a group of church ladies who were actually volunteering with a group called Scarlet Hope, an organization that assists with meals and love for girls working in strip clubs in Louisville, Kentucky, under the authority and leadership of Southeast Christian Church. Through Scarlet Hope, she met a woman named Joy Peterson. Lindsay told me she'd been kicked out where she was living and needed help. I know I couldn't fix all that, but I could be her friend. And although Lindsay continued to long for a better story, she had a hard time accepting this gift of friendship. Joy is a church lady, and I'm a stripper. I thought friendship would never work. Eventually, through God's blessing and the help of new Christian friends at, Lu at Southeast Christian, Lindsay decided to quit the club, so she got a job at a local restaurant and a temporary place to stay with a friend. She began reading her Bible, attending a Bible study at Scarlet Hope and worship church services at Southeast. Eventually, she changed her life. Why? Because her story wasn't finished being written. Pardon a personal reference. I met Jackie when I began my ministry at Kissimmee Christian Church in May of 2011. Her father was a military man who became very violent and abusive towards her from the time she was 10 years old until she later moved out. Jackie worked full-time while attending high school and graduated in 1975. She married the first man to ask her in 1978, and Jackie shared with me she felt so worthless and unloved that she literally sabotaged her own marriage. She got a job shortly after the wedding and started having an affair with a co-worker. When her husband found out about it, he killed the man. Over time, she got into more toxic relationships. She was evicted from multiple apartments. She sought meaning in her life, but kept coming up empty. She began to see herself as irreparable. Jackie later became a manager in a convenience store. She did well until once again she self-destructed and stole from her employer. She was arrested, lost her job, returned to the streets, but now with a criminal record. Jackie was, at this time, at an all-time low when God was able to get her attention, though. Jackie met a woman in our church who helped change her life by introducing her to the love of Jesus Christ. The Jackie I met in 2011 was not the same woman you've been reading about. Jackie was baptized into Jesus and began to religiously and seriously recover her dignity and her hope. She later moved into an apartment with another sister in Christ. She has two jobs, a car, is working to her college degree, to which she just graduated her associate's degree last year and is a student at Johnson University as of right now. She has restored her relationship with her two daughters and enjoys three amazing grandchildren. Members of Kissimmee Christian Church family are her biggest supporters even to this day. They love her and cheer for her consistently. She volunteers with Kissimmee Christian Church in multiple areas of ministry. And her passion, her number one passion, is working with our homeless ministry. Because that was where she was. The beauty is, there are countless thousands of people just like that whose stories are still being written because they have been sanctified by the blood of Jesus Christ. And they're no longer entangled in the yoke of bondage. And that's what sin is. So we've got to ignore the new tolerance move, movement today and challenge people, look, we love you enough to give you direction and hope through Jesus Christ. 
And if it weren't for the grace of Jesus Christ, we would be Jackie, would we not? And so in verses 9 through 12, Paul puts a plea out for genuine, biblically sound love and the essentiality of what a gentle spirit looks like. Take a look at verse 9 and 12. But concerning brotherly love, you have no need that I should write to you, for you yourselves are taught by God to simply love one another. So look how Paul transitions himself. Speaks to following Christ, getting away from the sin of sexual immorality, being free from that yoke, and now experiencing in a church family what genuine love looks like. And indeed, verse 10, you know, and indeed you do so toward all the brethren who are in Macedonia. But we urge you, brethren, that you just keep increasing in that love more and more and more and more. That you also aspire to live a quiet life, to mind your business and to work with your own hands as we commanded you. That you may walk properly toward those who are outside and that you lack nothing. Paul emphasizes the need to maintain the highest level of integrity, not just to other believers, but to those outside the faith, verses 11 and 12. Lead a quiet life. What does that mean? Well, it simply means Christianity is not a socially subversive teaching. You know, one reason why there's this huge evangelical revival in Iraq and Iran is because people are just sick and tired of being manipulated by religious elites. They're watching the Muslims and the hyper-Islam faith destroy people's lives that they don't follow lockstep into their world religion and they watch christians who aren't forced to follow jesus but because of our love for jesus is so real we're compelled to so we don't subvert people and i want people to know you can leave the church anytime you want i promise i won't chase you down i'll call on you i'll pray for you but you're free to make whatever choice you want to we're not going to subvert anybody we're not going to coerce anybody but i got to tell you The love of Jesus is of such magnitude that it draws people to him. And I just really believe if God's people could hate sin and love sinners, if we could love the redeemed, if we could practice genuine, authentic, brotherly love as the scriptures command us to do, I think the outside world would be so impressed because of all the hatred they see out there. They're dying to be a part of something that's different. It's real. Mind your business means just don't be a busybody. How about work to support yourself? Don't be burdened uh, to others in society. Work. And then finally, Paul inspires the church to develop a greater hope in him. Verses 13 through 18. I don't want you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning those who have fallen asleep, lest you sorrow at others who have no hope. For we believe that Jesus died and rose again, which is the crux, is it not, of our faith? Even so, God will bring with him those who sleep in Jesus. For this we say to you by the word of the Lord, that we who are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord will by no means precede those who are asleep, those who died in the faith. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven. I just want you to get this picture, because remember, the three worlds in which we live, the present world, the world within the kingdom world, and the eternal world, the longing for Christ's second return. So he closes this portion of his letter out by reminding us the Lord himself will descend from heaven. It's going to come with a shout the voice of an archangel, and the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. Then those who are alive, those who are still on this earth, serving, advancing the kingdom, enlarging their own spiritual centers until the day Jesus returns, shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and thus we will always be with the Lord. Isn't that great? There's going to come a time where we're going to hear that trumpet, and we're going to rise with those who had first died in the faith, and we will be with the Lord forever. Therefore, I need you to comfort one another with these words. Hope in this text refers to something more than optimism or positive thinking. No, in the context of the Christian gospel, it signifies a confidence about the future which is based on God's faithful promises. So when someone says, Jim, are you going to heaven? My answer is yes. Why? Because God is faithful. Not because of anything I have done, but because of his faithfulness to me. The living and the dead is actually those who have fallen asleep or died in the faith, for they have been in the Lord's presence already. And then Paul shares in verses 16 18 a very vivid picture of the Lord's second return. And artists have tried their best to, to give a glimpse of what this might look at. 
In closing, John shares these thoughts in Revelation 14, verse 13. John, of course, has a vision of heaven. He's been given permission to have this vision. And he says, I heard a voice from heaven saying to me, write this down. In other words, it's almost like the Holy Spirit nudges John and says, John, now listen, man, you make sure you get this down and you get it down just right because there's going to be some people in Ohio in October 2020 that are going to need to hear this. Okay, John says, I got it. Write this down, John. Blessed are the dead who die in the Lord. Now notice he doesn't say blessed are the dead. Because there are a lot of people dying right now that have no hope of salvation. No hope of heaven, which is very sad. Very sad. But not for those who are faith. For those who haven't just gotten in the race, but finished it. Blessed are the dead who die in the Lord. Now, it's, it's a habit of a lot of people. I know I do it too. When you hear someone dies, a friend or a brother or or, or a preacher that you used to know, the first thing you ask is, well, well, why did he die? Why did God take him so soon? You, you ever heard people say that? I know I have. Lord, you took him too soon. Or he, we always want to know how a person dies. Hey, so-and-so died. How did it happen? You know, we all assume now it's COVID, but you know, that's not, that's, there's more reasons than COVID. But we ask why or how or when. When did he die? I didn't hear this. I was just talking to a, a sister earlier and she said, a preacher friend of mine for years, I, I, I did not know he had passed away. I was like, well, of course, you know, I had to ask, when did he die? So John doesn't fool around with why people die or how people die or when they die. He only concerns himself with where people die. And I think that's the only thing that matters tonight. Blessed are those who die where? Yes, that's all that matters. Where did you die? He died in the Lord. That's all I need to know. That's all I need to know. Yes, says the Spirit, that they may rest from their labors and their works will follow them. Isn't it great to know that what you're doing right now will follow you long after you're gone? You know, Chuck Daddy's still living, but if God took Chuck home today, it would be safe to say that his works are still living on and the countless number of people that he touched. And I think that could be said about your preacher today. I look at my Bible college professors and I realize they're getting old and many of them have already started to, to, to make that way back to heaven. Some have already done that. But you know what's so great? The students who sat in their classes are preaching and teaching all over the world and their works will follow them. Let me ask you a question. Are you doing something right now that you want to follow you? Are you planting seeds right now that you want to grow up one day and feed other people for years to come? Well, you can. But I mean, you just got to commit to the spiritual kingdom of Christ. You got to commit to the kingdom work. And I mean, pour yourself into it because that's the only work that's sustainable. Hugh Hefner died valued at 90 million dollars when i think of his work and his labor i think man i hope that doesn't follow him much longer introduced pornography to countless millions of men destroyed millions of marriages degraded thousands of women that's not the kind of work you want to follow you is it no it's kingdom work that we want to follow us and will if we're faithful to the end I'm going to ask our musicians to come forward. They're going to sing a song of invitation as we conclude the service tonight. Look, here's the deal. Salvation is available to all who receive it. Say, how do I receive it? I thought grace was a gift. It is. It's a free gift. But you've got to unwrap it. How do I unwrap it? Well, first of all, you've got to believe that grace is for you. You've got to believe that the Jesus of the New Testament died for you and is coming back. And in believing that and the gospel accounts of his life and embracing his teachings, we're willing to verbally confess that, yes, that man named Jesus in the Bible is one that I believe is the divine Son of God. Deity. God and man, John 1, 17. And this whole idea of repentance is going to be very difficult. It's going to be very challenging. 
but I'm ready to sanctify myself tonight. I am prepared to set myself apart from a fallen and dying world and follow Jesus unconditionally. And I am so ready to be washed in the blood of the Lamb through Christian baptism. And arising to walk in a newness of life, as Paul says in Romans 6. Being fueled and empowered by His Holy Spirit and now joining the rank and file of other believers that are also Christian soldiers marching us to war. If you're ready to make that decision, we encourage you to do so as we stand, as we sing. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found. Was blind, but now I see. T'was grace that taught my heart to fear, and grace my fears relieved. How precious did that grace appear the hour I first believed my chains are gone I've been set free my God my Savior has ransomed me and like a flood His mercy reigns unending love amazing The Lord has promised good to me, His word my hope secures. He will my shield and portion be as long as life endures. My chains are gone, I've been set free. My God, my Savior, has ransomed me. And like a flood, His mercy reigns. Unending love, amazing grace. My chains are gone, I've been set free. My God, my Savior, has ransomed me. shall soon dissolve like snow the sun forbear to shine but God who called me here below will be forever mine will be forever mine you are forever mine. Amen. Thank you guys for leading us in that. And Jim, thank you uh, for the message. Uh, I love that reminder about Jesus coming again. And, and as Jim pointed out, there's those words after that. And it says, comfort one another with these words. And, and it seems like an abrupt thing to say to comfort one another with. You know, the... the Ends opening and Jesus coming back. It's comforting to us that Jesus is coming again. Uh, what a great night of revival. I hope that you are feeling revived. You know, revival has changed a little bit over the years. Uh, it used to be the target. Uh, the goal was for unbelievers to come to know the Lord. Baptisms and things like that. that we love that. 
Uh, if there's somebody still that hasn't done that, we'd love, love to talk with you and study with you. We don't just make these things up. Uh, as Jim said, we're trying to follow what the Bible says. Uh, but, but other than that, uh, maybe the goal is as much for all of us just to uh, pursue Jesus a little bit more closely, uh, to commit a little bit more to the work of the kingdom. And, and so maybe that's your resolve. I, I hope that that's what we're all seeking, is to be more like Jesus. And I, I hope that's what you leave here with tonight. And as we leave here, sin is abandoned, that Jesus is pursued, that we are more and more about kingdom work uh, and making a difference that lasts an eternity. Uh, thank you guys for uh, being here. What a great crowd. Encourage you. Uh, we have one more night of revival tomorrow. Everybody's invited back, of course, and uh, hopefully we have a, a few more. Uh, let's, uh, as we pray, I, I know uh, in about 45 minutes, Jim's going to be preaching to brothers and sisters in Jamaica. That's kind of cool, isn't it? Uh, that, that we have that kind of technology. Encourage you to pray about that, that, that they might be blessed, challenged uh, by that. I am going to ask if uh, one of our elders, if Ralph, will you close us in prayer? But I'm going to give you this doohickey to do it. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, God, we come before you tonight. We ask that you'll open our hearts, open our minds, help us to see your vision, to see your direction. Be with us as we travel to our homes. Help us to reach out to those around us. We ask all that in Jesus' name. Amen. Our God is an awesome God. He reigns from heaven above with wisdom power and love our god is an awesome god our god is an awesome god he reigns from heaven above with wisdom power and love our god is an awesome god our god is an awesome god